Hello again. So the next part of the circulatory system then is the heart. Now in the first part of the topic, we looked at the major blood vessels going into and out of the heart. So in this part, we're going to focus on the structure of the heart and how its structure relates to its function. And also we're going to be looking at the main chambers and the main blood vessels into and out of the heart. Now in the last section, we also talked about how the heart has a double circulation. So we can split it up into two sides, a left hand side, which is on your right, and then the right hand side, which is on your left. And that's basically because you're looking down at the heart. Now, we also said that the right hand side was the side which controls the pulmonary circulation, which takes blood to the lungs to receive oxygen. And we said that it pumps blood at a lower pressure to allow more time for gas exchange. And because it's only pumping blood a short distance, it only needs a low pressure. And then on the left hand side, it controls the systemic circulation, which pumps blood at a higher pressure, which goes all around the body. And it needs to be pumped at a high pressure to deliver the metabolites and remove waste from the cells quickly, and also to maintain the blood tissue fluid balance. Now, if we look here, this just shows us a model of the heart. So we can spin it around. Ooh, fancy. And there we go. Now, this is looking at the front of the heart. Now you've got to imagine here that you're looking straight ahead at somebody and looking at their heart. So that means that what we've got here is the right hand side over here and the left hand side over here. So the center of the heart is roughly split there and that would be the septum. Now obviously we would need to cut it open to see but just for a bit of a guideline we'll be able to point out some structures here. Okay, now over at this hand side would be our right atrium. Down here would be our right ventricle. Now these are pretty much just rough areas because it's very difficult to actually see what's going on unless we look inside, which we'll get to eventually. Now, around the back here is the left atrium and just down below it is our left ventricle. Now we've got all these blood vessels here and we will get slightly better at identifying them but for now let's just have a look and see what we can work out here. Now what we know is that the vena cava comes into the right atrium because it brings deoxygenated blood into the right hand side of the heart which is responsible for the pulmonary circulation. So that means that this here is the vena cava, this vessel here. This vessel coming out here is the aorta and it's carrying oxygenated blood from the left ventricle and it's gonna carry it to the rest of the body. Now moving on from that then, we can have a little look here just before we get into the inside of the heart. So the male heart, as we know, we've got a double circulation. So the heart has two pumps with each side pumping blood through two separate circulatory systems, which is the pulmonary and the systemic circulation. Both sides are separated by the thick muscular wall called the septum. Each side of the heart has two chambers, an atrium and a ventricle. The atria are at the top. Oh, that's a bit of a chunky pen. The atria are at the top and the ventricles are at the bottom. So basically what we've got here is the heart, a thick muscular wall called the septum separating them, and then two chambers on either side, atria and ventricles. And the middle part is the septum. As you might remember from GCSE, we also have little valves in between the atria and the ventricles. Now, if we have a look at the atria, the atria have very thin walls they receive blood from the lungs if it's a left atrium or the body if it's the right atrium and they only have to pump blood into the ventricles which lie directly below them. So they've got thin walls because they only have to pump blood a very short distance. The ventricles have a much thicker wall because they pump blood to the, to the lungs if it's the right ventricle or around the body if it's the left ventricle. 
the muscular wall of the left ventricle is considerably thicker than the wall of the right ventricle. Now, we know now that there's several reasons for that. The right ventricle, which goes to the lungs, it's only pumping blood a short distance and it only needs to create a low pressure to allow the most time for gas exchange. Whereas the wall of the left ventricle needs to pump it further. It needs to generate a high pressure to, de to, gen blah, 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 to deliver metabolites to the rest of the body and maintain the blood and tissue fluid balance. Now after that then, the heart itself has a very high metabolic rate. Now whenever we say, this comes up quite a lot in AS, whenever we talk about a high metabolic rate, it also means no, it's not exactly the same, but because it's got a high metabolic rate, it also means that it has a high rate of respiration. So by having a high metabolism, it means that there's a high rate of respiration taking place. So therefore, it needs lots of oxygen and also lots of nutrients. So because the heart has a high metabolic rate, it needs a constant supply of oxygen. And that's where this little bit comes into it. Now, the reason why it has a high metabolic rate is because it continually contracts throughout the life of an individual. Your heart never stops. If it does stop, you're in serious trouble. So this means that it has high respiratory demands and as a result, it needs a constant blood supply to the heart tissue. And it receives this from the coronary arteries which branch off from the aorta. So your coronary arteries branch off from the aorta. Now, it makes sense that it comes from the aorta because your aorta is about to deliver oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. Now, next thing we come to is this diagram, and this looks really complicated. So actually what we're going to start with is this one, which is in color. Maybe it's a bit less complicated for a first diagram to have a look at here. Now, if you fancy giving yourself a challenge here, you can pause it and see if there's anything you can identify here. So get a whiteboard or a piece of paper and just write the numbers 1 to 15 and see if you can work out what any of these are. Now, there's definitely some things which here are new to AS, but there's quite a few which you should be able to get. Now, I've numbered this in such a way that you should be able to identify these in order. So if you want to give yourself a challenge, pause it here, see how many you can get. So if we have a look at this, now what I would do is if you're about to label this for the first time in your booklet, wait until you see all the labels here because I've done them in different colors so that we can have some sort of identification of what does what. So in general, anything which carries oxygenated blood, you're going to write in red pen. Anything which is deoxygenated, you're going to write in blue pen. And any of the structures of the heart, you're going to write in black. Now, those structures can be found in either side of the heart, and that's why we're not really giving them a red or a blue color. So the septum's here, separating the left-hand side from the right-hand side. Now, if you just want to check your answers, remember, this is going to be the left-hand side of the heart, and this is going to be the right-hand side. So if, for example, you've got things like the atria or the ventricles, you might want to have a little look at them and make sure you've labeled them correctly as the left or the right-hand side. So number one then is the left atrium. Blood comes in here and it goes down to this part and number two is the left ventricle. Both of those carry oxygen in blood. Number three is the right atrium and number four is the right ventricle. After that then we go on to some other things which we might know which is the aorta which is this big red blood vessel here carrying oxygen in blood. And then number six is the superior vena cava. Now, we can see there that it enters the right atrium. What we can also see here down is number seven, which you might remember is the inferior vena cava, which is in the wrong color, but that should fix it. Now, after that then, we've got these little vessels going into the left atrium, carrying oxygenated blood. So if you think about it, where did this blood just come from that it picked up oxygen? The lungs. So these are the pulmonary veins. Now, if you think about it, why is there two of them? There's two of them because we've got two lungs. Now after that, we have got a blood vessel, number nine, 
which has just come from the right ventricle up through here, out there, and it actually splits up into two parts. And this is the pulmonary artery. Now this carries oxygenated blood to the lungs because the blood's gonna get transported there and pick up oxygen. Again, we've got two of them because you've got two lungs. The next one then is number 10 and 11. Now, these are on both sides of it. So we'll look at them both together. These are known as atrioventricular valves. Now, if you break up that word, atrioventricular, it pretty much separates the atrium, which is here, from the ventricles, which is here. So this AV valve is found in there. And I suppose I should say that, sometimes these are just called AV valves. Now, at AS, it's actually fine to call these atrioventricular valves. But what sometimes come up, comes up is the fact that these are called bicuspid and tricuspid valves. So the bicuspid valve is on the left hand side of the heart and it's called that because it only has two points of attachment with these little things which we'll get to later to the walls of the ventricle. Whereas the tricuspid valve has got three attachments. Now this is not the best diagram to show you so we're not going to focus too much on that. I'll show you that later on. So the bicuspid is on the left and the tricuspid is the right AV valve. Now, a good way to remember it, if you're trying to name them, you've got to try to be right. Because the tricuspid's on the right. Now after that then, we've got two more sets of valves, which is 12 and 13. And these are known as the semilunar valves. They're called semilunar valves because they are sort of crescent shaped like the shape of a half moon. So if we took that in cross section, that's the sort of thing that we would see. So this one is a semilunar valve leading into the pulmonary artery, hence why it's sometimes called the pulmonary valve. And this one here is the semilunar valve or the aortic valve because it leads into the aorta. After that then, we've got 14, which are papillary muscles and 15, which is the chordae tendinae. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit more about these, but the papillary muscles are basically found within the walls of the ventricle. They are attached to the chordae tendinae, which are sometimes known as the heart strings, and the heart strings attach to the valves. Now, we are gonna look at those in a bit more detail later on, so we'll come back to them. Now this diagram then is another one that's in your book and this one it might be a wee bit tricky as well so that's why we started with the other one. So what I'd maybe do here is pause it and see if you can actually try it and label anything. So let's get into this then. So remember this is the left hand side of the heart and this is the right hand side. So here we've got the left atrium, and then we've got the aortic valve, or you can call it the semilunar valve. Then down below that is the bicuspid valve. Below that is the chordae tendinae, and then we've got the left ventricle. Up here, we've got the aorta. Now, this is where this diagram can be quite confusing. If we follow this vessel here, the aorta, it actually comes across like this. And in real life, the aorta and the pulmonary artery cross over. So, this aorta comes from the opening of the left ventricle and blood goes there. Then on the right hand side, we've got the vena cava, we've got a right atrium, the tricuspid valve, the right ventricle. And finally, the pulmonary artery. Now, as I say, the pulmonary artery and the aorta cross over. So this here vessel 
is the pulmonary artery, which leads out. And then you can see here, it immediately branches off into two vessels, one for the left lung and one for the right lung. Now, if I were you, I would spend more time learning this diagram than this one. This one's just very complicated, but I think it's a good one because it's a good tough one to learn. But, as I say, focus mostly on this one. Now, again, pause it here and see what you can label from this, just as an extra bit of practice. And there's your answers for it. Now, before you go any further, pause it here and try and label these ones as well. It's really important that you have an extremely good understanding of the different structures in the heart before we go on to the next part, which is going to be the cardiac cycle. So pause it here and see if you can get the answers. And then I'll reveal them in a couple of seconds. So there's your answers again. Oh, should have done it a bit slower. Two is the left ventricle, three is the right atrium, four is the right ventricle, five is the aorta, six is the superior vena cava, seven is the inferior vena cava, eight is the pulmonary veins, nine is the pulmonary artery, ten is the bicuspid valve or AV valve, and then we've got the tricuspid valve or the AV valve as well, twelve is the semilunar valve, thirteen is the semilunar valve as well, and then fourteen is the papillary muscle, and 15 is the chordae tendinae. Now, if you want a bit more practice, here we go. And then the answers one by one. So the aorta, pulmonary vein, left atrium, bicuspid valve, left ventricle, vena cava, semilunar valve, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and septum. Now, just to finish this off, there's two wee things we want to look at. The differences in wall thickness, and also the link between the valves, papillary muscles, and chordae tendinae. So, first up, the difference in wall thickness. Now, here we can see a photograph of the heart. This is the left-hand side, oops, and this is the right-hand side. Now, you can see here that the left-hand side is much thicker than the right-hand side. Or I should say, the left ventricle wall is much thicker than the right ventricle wall. Now, the reason for that is the right ventricle only has to pump blood a short distance. And that is to the lungs. It also pumps it at a low pressure, which favours gas exchange. And also, if it was a higher pressure it might damage the pulmonary capillaries. Whereas the left-hand side of the ventricle, or sorry, the left ventricle wall, is thicker because it pumps blood a longer distance, which requires the pump, blood to be pumped at a higher pressure so that it can reach respiring tissues quickly. And you can also say there, so that it delivers the metabolites to the respiring tissues and maintains the blood tissue fluid balance. Now, moving on from that then, we've got the papillary muscles and the chordae tendinae. So, here we've got a few cross sections of the heart. Now, this is a cross section of the left ventricle, so you're looking at this diagram. So here's the left atrium, which you can see has really thin walls. And this is the mitral valve, which is the bicuspid valve. It's called a bicuspid valve, as I said, because bi means two. And here, we have two attachments to the wall of the left ventricle. Now, what you can see here is, this is the valve. The valves are attached to the chordae tendinae. And then the chordae tendinae are attached to the papillary muscles, which are basically just little bumps of muscles which are pretty much protruding from the wall of the left ventricle, and they stick out 
we can also see them here. So this is the chordae tendinae. And these wee flappy bits here make up the valve. And that means that this little lump here is the papillary muscle. Now here's the actual function of them. So the AV valves separate the atria and the ventricles. And as we know, it stops the blood from flowing backwards through the heart. The chordae tendinae are the strong tendons which stop the valves turning inside out. So this is quite a simplified animation of them. So here's the valves up here. Attached to them in this region, these little stringy bits are the chordae tendinae. And then finally, the papillary muscles down here in the walls of the ventricle. Now, the link between these is that the valves stop the blood going backwards from the ventricles back to the atria. The chordae tendinae are really strong tendons which stop them turning inside out. But what happens whenever the ventricles contract is they contract with such force that if there wasn't these tendons, the valves would turn inside out. So these valves help, or sorry, these tendons help prevent the valves turning inside out. The papillary muscles will contract as the walls of the ventricle is contracting and that stops the valves turning inside out. Now we can actually also see here these little semi-lunar valves up there. And they're not as well designed or, well, they don't really need to be as complex as the AV valves. But the semi-lunar valves are known as pocket valves. And we'll have a little look at that in a second. Now just to finish this off then, so the blood leaves the heart and pulses that coincide with each heartbeat and the heart is a one-way pump and the valves prevent the backflow of blood. Now we've got two sets, AV valves which are between the atria and the ventricles and the semilunar valves which are between the ventricles and the arteries. So the atrioventricular valves, the bicuspid and tricuspid, ensure blood doesn't travel back into the atria when the ventricles contract. Now remember, the tricuspid is on the right, bicuspid is on the left. So they ensure that the blood doesn't travel from the ventricles to the atria when the, when the ventricles contract. The valves are anchored by the papillary muscles, which are embedded in the ventricle wall. The chordae tendinae link the muscles and the valves. So we've got the valves there separating the atria and the ventricles. Then we have the tendons which are attached to them. And then we have the papillary muscles which are embedded in the wall of the ventricle. So we've got valves, chordae tendinae, and then the papillary muscles, and that's the link between them. So the tendons are extremely tough and flexible, but not elastic, ensuring that when the ventricles contract, the AV valves do not turn inside out due to high pressure, which would allow blood to flow back into the atria. The papillary muscles contract to keep the chordae tendinae taut. The semilunar valves prevent the blood returning back into the ventricles from the arteries when the pressure falls between pulses. The semilunar valves are pocket valves on the artery walls that only close when blood pressure in the arteries exceeds the pressure in the ventricles. So basically, when the ventricles contract, it forces blood up through the semilunar valves and into the arteries. But when the ventricles stop contracting and the pressure falls, the valves will close and that stops blood falling back into the ventricles. When, it's blood, when blood is being pumped out of the ventricles, the valves are pushed flat against the artery walls and do not impede flow. So when the ventricles contract, now let's say that this is the ventricle and this is the artery, the semilunar valves 
are found there, just in the opening to the artery. Now, when the ventricle is not contracting, they're going to be like that. But when the ventricles contract, instead of being sitting out like that, they're pushed flat up against the wall of the artery. Now, they're basically called pocket valves because they're a bit like the pockets in your trousers. If there's nothing in them, they'll stay flat up against your leg. But if you put stuff in them, they'll open up like that. So they're like little pockets. Now, final bit here is the four major vessels that enter or leave the heart. So we're just going to note down what type of blood they carry and what direction. So the aorta carries oxygenated blood. And it carries it from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. And it is part of the systemic circulation. We'll also do the pulmonary artery, which carries deoxygenated blood. And it carries it from the right ventricle. To the lungs and then the vena cava carries deoxygenated blood from the body to the right atrium finally then we've got the pulmonary vein which is going to carry oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. Now, that pretty much shows the main blood vessels. It's really important before we go on here to the next section that you know all the different parts of the heart and all the different structures. And the first wee section is gonna be being able to write a little flow chart of where blood is coming to and going from in the heart. So we should know that on the right hand side, over here, blood enters the vena cava, it goes into the right atrium, the right ventricle, and then it goes up and out through the pulmonary artery. Likewise, on the left hand side of the heart, we should know that blood returns from the lungs in the pulmonary vein, it goes into the left atrium, it goes through the bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle and then from the left ventricle it goes up through the semilunar valves into the aorta to the rest of the body. So make sure that between this section and the next section you spend a lot of time learning the structures of the heart and you know how blood flows through the heart. It is extremely important and it will make the next section so much easier.